Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyana Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ama ba'd What about paying the debt of someone who is deceased or paying or making up fasting for someone who is deceased An Abdullah bin Abbas radiyallahu ta'ala anhu maqal Jaa rajulun ila nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam faqal Ya Rasulullah inna ummi matat wa alayha sawmun shahr afaqdihi anha قال لو كان على أمك أمك دين أكنت قضية قضيه عنها قال نعم قال فدين الله أحق أن يقضي رواه بخاري ومسلم وفي رواية جاءت امرأة إلى نبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فقالت يا رسول الله إن أمي ماتت وعليها صوم نظر أفا أصوم عنها قال أفرأيت لو كان على أمك دين فقديته فقديت فقديته أكان يؤدي ذلك عنها قالت نعم قال فصومي عن أمك أمك رواه مسلم إن سديث these ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which illustrate for us the ruling pertinent to making up the fast on someone who is deceased. In the first hadith, it was a hadith of Abdullah bin Abbas anhuma, who said that a man came to the Prophet ﷺ, and he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah ﷺ, barely my mother is deceased. And she didn't complete her, her, her fasting of, uh, of a month. Should I make it up for her? And the Prophet ﷺ responded by saying, If your mother had left a debt, wouldn't you pay that on her behalf? He said, Yes. And then the Prophet ﷺ responded by saying, the debt of a law is more worthy of being paid. And this is in Bukhari and Muslim. And in another narration, a woman came to the Prophet Wasallam, and she said, O oh, Messenger of Allah Wasallam, verily my mother has passed and she has to, she didn't make up her fast of another, you know, of making a vow. Should I fast on her behalf? The Prophet ﷺ said, Don't you agree that if your mother had a debt that you would pay it on her behalf? She said, yes. The Prophet ﷺ said, fast on her behalf. And that was narrated in Muslim. What we learn from this hadith is that the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the ulama illustrate haquq illah mabni al musamaha that the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are built upon forgiving forgive uh, of, of being forgive uh, you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most merciful and he forgives us sometimes when we fall short in making up those acts of ibadah that we should make up and the haquq uh, nas mabni al mushaha that the rights of people are built upon that people, you know, they want their haq and they, they're not as, they're not forgiving. So we must make up the rights of others to the best of our ability. Another benefit of this hadith is that this hadith illustrates for us no matter what the the fasting that needs to be made made up, whether it's from uh, Ramadan or it's from another, that from a vow, that uh, we should strive. Someone on the behalf of the person who died should make it up on their behalf. Bi Allah Taala. And as we mentioned in the prior hadith, that it is not 
an obligation upon them, but they should, it is better for them to do so on behalf of the person who deceased. Another benefit of this hadith is that this hadith illustrates for us the principle of qiyas in the sharia, the principle of making an analogy, you know, through jurisprudic jurisprudent reasoning, meaning the people of ilm, of knowledge, looking at two different things in the Sharia and making an analogy, a Sahih analogy which is supported by evidence from the Quran and the Sunnah or from the understanding of the Salaf by them making a, a sound analogy and that that analogies are not they're considered a part of the evidences in the Quran and the Sun in, in, in the Sharia meaning that the Sharia is comprised of four things that are considered evidence the first thing and this is in with the majority of the ulama. The first thing is the Quran and then the Sunnah of the Prophet. ﷺ. Those are both Dalil, those are Nasus, those are text. Then we have the Qiyas. Qiyas meaning, uh, as we mentioned, making analogies from one aspect possibly of ibadah to another or one aspect of something to make an analogous reason uh, reason that is in agreement with the Sharia and another aspect of evidence in the Sharia is the ijma meaning the consensus of the ulama the, if the ulama have agreed upon something then that is considered dalil it's considered evidence that you cannot go against it is something that they are united on because it's not possible that as the prophet sallallahu said my ummah would not unite on dalal on, on misguidance so means if the whole ummah or the the the, the people of ijtihad, the people of uh, of knowledge and fiqh and understanding of the religion who know the Quran, know the Sunnah, know the understanding of the Salaf, have united about something. They do not unite upon their desires, but they unite upon Kitab wa Sunnah and the understanding of the religion. So that's why that is taken as a hujjah, it's taken as evidence for something. When, when the ulama say that there's ijma, if it's a sahih ijma, that the, that the scholars are really in that time period had consensus about th such and such issue, whether it was something in creed, whether it was something in fiqh, then that is taken as an, a source of evidence. Or whether it be a consensus ijma in this day and age, that ijma of the scholars say that riba is haram then there's no room for someone to say, well, no, riba is halal or something. No, because the ulama, the scholars, the warath al-anbiya, those people who inherit, who are the inheritance, the inheritors of the prophets, alayhim after salatu wasalam, have united upon that based on kitab, wa sunnah, and understanding of the salaf, they've united upon that opinion, and that opinion is not based on desires, and that means they have no difference in opinion. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, and we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil, and we hope that Allah subhanahu wa accepts all of our good deeds, and protects us from all of our evil deeds, and helps us to be better slaves of His subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiya Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.